tomorrow ever come? Huh. Hmm, why can a fish get seasick? I have a question. Why does the Easter Bunny bring eggs if rabbits do not lay eggs? The opposite of opposite the same or opposite? What? Why is a pizza box square when a pizza is round? If the truth is different for each of us, how can we call it the truth? word. Before we get started, I want to take a moment and just thank Steve and Stephen for bringing the word the last two weeks. Didn't they do a great job? We are blessed as a church to have multiple men that have power when they proclaim God's word. Different temperaments, different personalities, but all with a heart for God and ability to, to, to preach and teach God's word. I am so thankful for that. But I'm also thankful to be back with you. And so I want you to get your Bible, hold it up, and repeat after me what we believe about this book. This is God's Word. Is God's Word. It is a perfect treasure of divine instruction. It has God for its author, God for its author. salvation for its end, for its and truth without any mixture of error for its matter. It is the supreme source of truth for what we believe and how we live. Now, I want to invite you to turn with me to three passages of Scripture this morning. The first one is John chapter 14. John, the last of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the New Testament, John chapter 14. And once you find John chapter 14, I want you to put your finger there, a piece of paper there, but hold your place there and turn over to the next book in the Bible, the book of Acts, and turn with me to Acts chapter 4. So John chapter 14, and then Acts chapter 4. And then after you get to Acts chapter 4, I want you to put a piece of paper there or mark that page so you can come back to it, and then turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 2. It's a little bit further along in your New Testament, but 1 Timothy chapter 2. So John 14, Acts 4, 1 Timothy chapter 2. Back when I was in college, I took a, a class that was entitled Religions of the World, and to be honest with you, that class kind of rocked my world. And understand, I grew up in church. I was in church every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. I knew what the Bible said about God. I knew what the Bible said about Jesus. I knew what the Bible said about salvation. But when I took this class, this religions of the world class, it, it threw me for a loop. As we were studying all of these various religions, Judaism and, and Buddhism and Hinduism and Islam and, and all of these smaller religions as well, and, and I began to see the zeal and the commitment of the people who believed those various teachings, and I realized that many of them were more committed than I was, I began to struggle with my faith. I began to ask myself, is Jesus the only way to heaven? Is Jesus the only way to, to be saved? Can these people who are devout and, and committed and really believe what they believe, can they go to heaven as well? And, and I was struggling with this. So much so that one night as I was studying and preparing for this class, I fell asleep and I had a dream. Now, I want you to listen to me. I'm not a proponent of interpreting dreams. And Primarily because of two things. One, God has given us his word, and I believe God communicates to us today primarily through his word. But the second reason is because my dreams are always wild. They're crazy. They're weird. Like, I ate too much garlic weird. That kind of thing. And the dream I had that night was weird. But God used that dream in my life, so I'm going to share it with you. So I fell asleep, and I began dreaming, and I was in this big dark house, a scary house, a scary mansion. 
And as I was walking through this house, I encountered a vampire. Yeah, that's right, a Dracula kind of vampire. And that vampire began chasing me all through the house. You can imagine, I didn't want to become a vampire, become vampire foo, so I was running, and I ran into one room, and, and in that room, I found a gun, and I took the gun, and I shot the vampire, but it didn't stop the vampire. It kept coming for me. I ran into another room, and there was a knife. I picked up the knife. I stabbed the vampire, but, but stabbing the vampire didn't stop the vampire. It kept on coming for me. And as I continued to dream, I went from room to room to room, seeing various things in these rooms, and I would pick them up, and I would use them against the vampire, but nothing stopped the vampire. Now, this morning, we're starting a new series. We're calling it Q&A, Your Questions, the Bible's Answers. And today, we're going to look at the first question, and this is the question that was turned in that I want to answer. The question asked, in God's Word, are Catholics and Jews saved? In God's Word, are Catholics and Jews saved? Now, I'm going to answer that question specifically in a minute. But before I do, I want to answer that question a little more generally. I want to answer the question, who is it that goes to heaven? Who is it that goes to heaven? I want us to begin by looking at what Jesus said about this. And that's what we see in, in John chapter 14. Jesus is preparing his disciples for his death and then his resurrection and then his return to heaven. And as he prepares them, he tells them that he is going to prepare a place for them in his father's house. His father's house is heaven. And, and Philip says, Jesus, we don't know where that is. How can we find the way to the Father's house, how are we going to be able to find the way to heaven? And that's where Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 6, I want you to listen to what he said. It says, Jesus told them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Don't miss what Jesus said. Jesus said, no one can come to the Father, can get to heaven, except through Jesus. And on that, that word, no one, in the Greek language, it is an interesting word. It really is. You know what it really means? No one. Nobody. Jesus said that nobody, absolutely no one, can go to heaven except through him. Next, I want us to go to Peter. And to do that, we're going to look at Acts chapter 4. In Acts chapter 3, Jesus or Peter had had, and John were going to the temple, and on their way to the temple, they met this man who had been crippled from birth, and, and Peter healed the man. And when he healed the man, this crowd gathered around Peter and John, and this man who was lame, who could now walk, and so Peter began to preach the gospel, the good news about Jesus. And the Bible tells us in chapter 4 that, that the number of believers that day arose to over 5,000 men, so probably over 1,000 people were saved that day at the temple as Peter preached about Jesus. But as Peter was preaching, the temple guards came and some Sadducees and some other religious leaders and, and, and they began to question Peter and they threw Peter and John in jail for the night. The next morning, they got Peter and John and they brought them before the, the Sanhedrin, the, the Supreme Court of the Jews. And the high priest asked, by whose name and whose power are you doing these things that you're doing? The Bible tells us that Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he began to answer these religious leaders. And in verse 12, he said this. He said, there is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. Now, did you hear that? Peter, who was the leader of the early church, Peter, who tradition tells us was crucified upside down in Rome for his faith in Jesus. Peter said, salvation cannot be found in anyone else except Jesus Christ. Peter said, Jesus is the only way. Now, I don't want you to turn on with me to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 
The, the letter of 1 Timothy was written to Timothy. Timothy is Paul's son in the ministry. And many people believe that at this point, Timothy was the pastor. He was the elder of the church in Ephesus. And, and Paul is writing Timothy, his son in the ministry, giving him some guidance and direction as he tries to pastor this very unique growing church in Ephesus and as he gets to that chapter 2 he's telling Timothy to pray for all people and then he tells us that that it's God's desire that all people be saved that all people come to the knowledge of the truth and then in verse 5 Paul says this he says for there is only one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity the man, Jesus Christ. And did you hear what the Apostle Paul said? This, this great missionary that took the gospel all around the world. He said there is only one who can reconcile man to God. And that one is Jesus Christ. You see, the Bible is crystal clear. There is only one way to heaven, and that's through Jesus Christ. And yet, we know that's not what most people believe today. I've discovered that in our culture, there are two popular misconceptions. The first one is this. Religion leads to heaven. Religion leads to heaven. If you're religious, you go to heaven. It really doesn't matter what religion you have. You can be Christian, you can be Jewish, you can be Buddhist, you can be Muslim, you can be Hindu, you can be Sikh, you can be whatever, but as long as you're religious, you will go to heaven. Bill O'Reilly used to be a staple on Fox News. He had a show called The O'Reilly Factor, and in that show, he had these talking points that he used. And one night in his talking point, he made a statement that articulated what many people believe today. He began with a joke, and then he made his point. The joke was, he said, that St. Peter was leading this new group of arrivals through heaven, showing them all the, the places in heaven. And as they got to this room, Peter turned to the new arrivals and said, Shh, you can't make a sound as we pass this room. You can't say a thing. You've got to be completely quiet. So everybody was quiet and they got past the room. And when they got past the room, one of the new arrivals turned and said, Why? Why do we have to be so quiet when we pass that room? And St. Peter said, Well, that room is filled with Southern Baptists. They think they're the only ones here. And, and we're Southern Baptists. And sometimes we kind of have that idea that, you know, we're the only ones that, that are going to go to heaven. Back when I was a kid, Growing up, I kind of had that idea. You know, those Methodists, they're all messed up. Those Catholics, they're really messed up. Those Presbyterians, they're trying to be like us, but they've messed up too. You know, so I kind of thought we were the only ones that, that went to heaven. But then Bill Riley said this. He said, I found that any remark I make about religion is likely to make some viewers steaming. And the fundamentalists really hate it when I say something like this. The most important thing I can say about religion is that it is good for all to have it. Did you hear that? The only thing I can say about religion is that it is a good thing for all of us to have. It doesn't really matter what you believe as long as you believe something. Now, did you hear that? Bill O'Reilly said it really doesn't matter what you believe as long as you believe something. When President Obama was running for president, he said that he believed that Jesus died for his sins. But then in the very next statement, he said he also believes that Jews and Muslims and non-believers who live moral lives are as much a child of God as he is. Now, I mean no disrespect to Bill O'Reilly or President Obama, but both of them got it wrong. It does matter what you believe, and not everyone is a child of God. You see, this is a popular view today because it makes us feel good. We feel like we're tolerant of other people and other people's views. But the problem with this is that it's wrong for two reasons. It's built on a faulty foundation. The first reason is this. It, it lacks a belief in absolute truth. Absolute truth. 
you, you see, the world teaches that there is a truth that is true, and that truth cannot change. There are laws of nature. There's the law of gravity. Nothing can change that truth. It's a truth. Two plus two equals four. That's a truth. It's true. There are truths out there. And yet today, we've come to believe what's true for you is not necessarily true for me. In the book of Proverbs, Solomon said, there's a way that seems right to man, but in the end, it leads to death. And that's this whole idea that there are many roads, there are many avenues to heaven. That seems good. It makes us feel good inside. But the problem is, it leads to death. You see, you don't get to determine truth. I don't get to determine truth. Truth is truth. It's true regardless of whether you believe it. It's true regardless of whether I believe it. Truth is truth. My opinions, my beliefs, my ideas don't define truth. Truth defines truth. And we better do everything we can while we live on planet Earth to discover truth. You see, 2 plus 2 equals 4. That's true. 2 plus 3 equals 4. That's false. And nothing is ever true going to change that there's the people who say it doesn't matter what you believe you just need to believe something they are rejecting absolute truth and there is absolute truth the second problem with this view is it doesn't deal with the irreconcilable differences of different religions you see there are some religions that have similarities but but when you really study them they are very different let me just give you a couple for instance what does various religions say about God? Well, Buddhism teaches that there is no God. At least there is no personal God. Hinduism teaches that there are hundreds and thousands of gods. But those gods are personal, impersonal gods. Islam teaches that there is a God. Allah is his name, but he is an impersonal God. Judaism teaches that there is a God and Jehovah is his name. Christianity, on the other hand, teaches that there is a personal God who is all-knowing, who is all-loving, who is all-powerful, and he has revealed himself to us in Jesus Christ. Now, those things aren't the same. They're different. What about the afterlife? Buddhism teaches that there is no afterlife. There's simply nirvana. When you die, you quit suffering. Hinduism teaches that you're reincarnated over and over again until you merge with the ultimate reality. They like to say it this way, we become a single drop in the ocean of the universe. Islam teaches there is eternal life, but that eternal life is earned. Judaism teaches there is eternal life, but that eternal life is earned. Christianity teaches that eternal life is received as a free gift through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. You see, these religions teach diametrically opposing things, so they can't all be truths. The differences are too deep and the truth is too narrow for them to all be right. But here's the truth you need to understand. No religion will get you to heaven not even Christianity. Because we aren't saved by our religious deeds, we are saved through Jesus Christ. So some people believe that religion gets us to heaven. Other people believe that a good life gets us to heaven. That's what the vast majority of people say when I ask them this question. In, in decades of sharing Jesus, I've asked this question a lot. If you were standing before God right now, and he asked you, why should I let you into heaven? What would you say? You think about it for a minute. If you were standing before God right now and he asked you, why should I let you into heaven? What would you say? The overwhelming majority of people that I've asked that question have given an answer like this. Well, I've done my best. I've tried hard. I've been a good father or a good mother or a good husband. I haven't done fill in the blanks. I have done fill in the blanks. It's all about our works. We believe that our works and our efforts are going to get us to heaven. But here's what I discovered. Almost everyone believes that their works and efforts are good enough to get them into heaven. 
It doesn't matter who you're talking to. I could be talking to someone who's cheated on their spouse multiple times. They think they're good enough to get to heaven. I could be speaking to someone who has stole millions of dollars and they think they're good enough to get to heaven. I could be speaking to someone who is a compulsive liar and they believe they're good enough to get to heaven. No matter who we are, we think that our goodness will get us to heaven. And so if we earn our way to heaven, if we get to heaven by being good, then how good do we have to be? If I get to determine how good you have to be, some of you ain't going to make it. But if you get to determine how good you have to be, I may not make it. So who gets to decide how good we have to be? Maybe, maybe we come to the end of, of life as we know it. Everybody has died. We've entered into eternal life, and we elect a committee. And that committee determines what we have to do, how good we have to be to get to heaven. Boy, that would be horrible, wouldn't it? I mean, we'd really want to be on that committee, wouldn't we? You see, that's the problem. You and I don't get to determine how good we have to be. God is the determiner of goodness. God is the creator of all things, and God is the one who decides what is good. And God has said this about the human race. No one is good. Not a single one of us. That's what God said about us. God said our righteous acts, our good deeds, are like filthy clothes. God has said that we are all sinners. We have all fallen short of the glory and the standard that God has set. Every single one of us. You see, we're not good enough to get to heaven. None of us are. You can't earn your way to heaven. You can't be religious enough to go to heaven. That's why Jesus came. Jesus came to save us so that we could go to heaven. He didn't come to teach us how to live, though he taught us some incredible truths. He didn't come to minister to people's needs and meet their needs, though he certainly did that. Jesus came to this earth to be the Savior of the world, and Jesus claimed to be the only way to heaven. Think about that for just a moment. Jesus claimed to be the only way to heaven. It's a wild claim, isn't it? This man who was born some 2,000 years ago in a stable in Bethlehem, who grew up, became a carpenter, and then became an itinerant teacher traveling around the Palestinian area, that man claimed to be the only way to heaven. It's crazy. C.S. Lewis said this, he said, either this man was and is the son of God, or else he's a madman or worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with this patronizing nonsense about him being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Someone else said this. They said, if Jesus is just a good man, the heart of the good news is ripped out of Christianity and the Bible is not worth the paper it is written on. You see, there's really only four choices. Jesus is a liar. Jesus is a lunatic. Jesus was simply a legend or a myth or he is Lord. He wasn't a, a liar. Josh McDowell in his book, Evidence That Demands a Verdict, said this. He said, if when... Jesus made his claims. He knew that he was not God. He was lying. But he was not a liar. But if he was a liar, then he was also a hypocrite. Because he told others to be honest, whatever the cost, while himself teaching and living a colossal lie. And more than that, he was a demon. Because he told others to trust him for their eternal destiny. If he could not back up his claims and he knew it, then he was unspeakably evil. And finally, he would be a fool. Because if it was his claims of being God that led to his crucifixion, Jesus wasn't a liar. Was he a lunatic? Was he crazy? If you look at his life, you determine this man wasn't crazy. He was filled with incredible wisdom. He taught profound truths. 
His life was filled with service to people throughout. He confounded people with, with the wisdom that he always came back with them. He was not a lunatic. He was not crazy. What about a legend? Maybe Jesus didn't really exist. Some people believe that today. But, but hardly any thinking person accepts that truth. They reject it because it's just fallacy to say with all the evidence that Jesus never existed. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. He grew up in Nazareth. He died on a cross in Jerusalem. We can debate whether he rose from the grave or not. We can debate that. But you can't debate whether he lived and whether he died. You can't debate what he said, what he claimed. Jesus wasn't a legend. So who is he? Well, he's Lord. And he proved it by being resurrected from the grave. And the Apostle Paul said this in Philippians chapter 2. He said, therefore God elevated him to the place of highest honor. And gave him the name above all other names. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. In heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Either Jesus is the only way to heaven or he isn't a way to heaven. Either the world is right and we are wrong, or we are right and the world is wrong. We cannot compromise on this issue. Listen, if you're a Christ follower, you cannot compromise on this. Either Jesus is the only way to heaven, or he is not. And if he's not, leave here and don't come back because you're wasting your time. But I'm here to tell you today, Jesus is the way to heaven. Now, what about those who have never heard about Jesus? There are many that ask that question, so let me make several observations. The first one is this, God is fair. The Bible makes it clear from cover to cover that God is fair in the way he treats people. What that means is no one is going to ever stand before God and say, I wanted to know you, but I didn't have the chance. Because God is fair, God is going to give people a chance to know him. The second thing you need to understand is everyone has some knowledge of God. The Bible makes that clear. In Romans chapter 1, verse 20, it says, For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. God has revealed himself through his creation to everyone. And what should that do? That should give man a desire to know who he is, to understand his creator so that he can worship him. Third, God reveals himself to those who are truly seeking. I believe with all my heart, God will move heaven and earth to make himself known to anyone who truly wants to know him. And finally, no one, absolutely no one can earn their way to heaven. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, the contemporary English version, it says you were saved by faith in God who treats us much better than we deserve. This is God's gift to you and not anything you have done on your own. It isn't something you have earned, so there's nothing you can brag about. So how do we go to heaven? Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, that word kurios means master, you confess that Jesus is your master. And you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Not believe with your head, but believe with your heart. And then it says, for it is by believing in your heart that you're made right with God. It is by confessing with your mouth that you're saved. How are we saved? We believe with our heart that God really did raise Jesus from the dead, that he did what he said he was going to do. We don't just believe it with our mind. We don't just know the facts. No, the facts have made their way to our heart and have penetrated our heart. That's why we have that saying, we have Jesus in our heart. We believe with all of our heart God raised Jesus from the dead. And when we believe that, it causes us to confess that Jesus is now our Lord, our Master. And so let me ask you, is Jesus your Savior and Lord? The only guarantee of heaven is a personal relationship with Jesus. I want to go back to that question we started with. Do Catholics and Jews go to heaven according to the Bible? 
Well, it all depends. There will be Catholics in heaven. There'll be Jews in heaven. There'll be Presbyterians in heaven. There'll be Methodists in heaven. There'll be some Lutherans in heaven. There'll even be a few Baptists in heaven. But they won't be in heaven because they're Jewish or they're Catholic or they're Presbyterian or they're Baptist or anything else. They'll be in heaven because they've bent their knee to Jesus and surrendered their life to him as Lord. On the other hand, in hell, the other place, there'll be Catholics, there'll be Jews, there'll be Presbyterians, there'll be Methodists and Lutherans. I believe there'll be a lot of Baptists in hell. People who have a head knowledge of Jesus. They've heard the truth, but they don't know the truth in their heart. So what about you? Oh, yeah. Let me get back to my dream. So I was running around this house trying to get away from this vampire, and finally I went into this room, and there was a cross in the room. And I had seen enough vampire movies to know that vampires don't like crosses. So I picked up the cross. The vampire quit chasing me. I touched the cross to the vampire. The vampire disappeared. I immediately woke up. In my dream, my only hope of being saved was the cross. I went to bed asking God, is there any other way to be saved? And he gave me a dream. The only hope of salvation is the cross. So have you knelt at the cross? Have you realized that your only hope is the blood of Jesus that was shed on that cross? And because of what he's done for you, you have surrendered your life to him. Oh, dear brothers and sisters, listen to me. When Jesus comes into your heart, he changes your life. If you haven't had life changed, you haven't been saved. That's just plain and simple. There's no way that the God of all creation can come to live inside of you without changing you. When you surrender your life to him, trusting him to save you, giving him power to be Lord of your life, he changes you from the inside out. So have you been saved? Have you been changed? Because I'm here to tell you, God wants you to be saved according to the authority of God's word. I believe with all my heart. There are some of you here right now. There's something going on inside of you. You're feeling this tug. You, you're feeling like, I don't know if I'm saved or not. I don't know if I've ever given my life to Jesus. Can I just be honest with you for a second? That's the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit of God is trying to draw you to himself. The Holy Spirit of God is saying, I want you. Be a part of my family. Let me change you. Let me make you new. Let me, let me come into your life and help you become what I created you to become. And I would challenge you today, don't resist the Holy Spirit. Surrender your life to Jesus. I want you to bow your head and close your eyes. With your head bowed and with your eyes closed, if you're here and and you're going, Rocky, I know that I'm not saved. I, there's no question about it. Or you're here and you're going, man, I feel like maybe I'm not saved. And I'm here to tell you, God wants to do a work in your life today. And I just want to encourage you to let him. And if you're here and you're ready to surrender, you're quit, you want to quit resisting and just do what he wants you to do, then I want to encourage you to pray this prayer to him right now. Dear God. I humbly come to you today acknowledging that I'm a sinner. I've disobeyed you. I've lived life my way. I realize my religion can't get me to heaven. I realize my good deeds will never get me to heaven. I need you, Jesus. 
Jesus, I believe you came to this earth. You died on the cross. You rose from the grave so that I could be forgiven and saved. Save me right now. Jesus, I'm giving my life to you. I want to follow you for the rest of my life. Thank you for hearing my prayer. Thank you for saving me. Now with your head still bowed, your eyes still closed, please.